Welcome, everybody. I'm so excited that we all get to be here tonight. We just get to worship our, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, how amazing he is in our lives. And we get to do this in the middle of our week. We get to praise him in the middle of the week. So we're so excited. Yes, Jesus, God, we just ask for you to come in amazing ways tonight. God, we know you're already here. But God, we just want to know more about you, God. We just want to worship you. We just want to worship you tonight. you let me fall and all 
There wasn't a day that you're not by my side. And there wasn't a day that you let me fall. And all of my life, your love has been true.
give our hearts, we give our lives. Nothing held back from you. Nothing held back from you. Nothing held back from you. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's why we're here. Thanks, Lord, to encounter your presence. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, let's honor Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, bringing us right into the throne room. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, Lord. If you're watching with us online, we want to welcome you as well. This is our testimony time. So testify what God has been doing in your life. Give some glory to the Lord. Come on, Miss Melissa. Here she comes. Yeah, this is the time where we share the goodness of the Lord. We get to testify what God has been doing and what he's been speaking to us, and then we get to take other people's testimonies for ourselves. Yes. Mine is continued from last week, so if you weren't here, I testified all these great things. My dog still healed. I didn't get a lasagna this week, but God is still good. I made my own meals. Um, and I was sharing how this article that Amanda wrote touched me so deeply, and I remembered that in 2019, I wrote in one of my journals something about her, and I was like, I'm going to find it, I'm going to find it, and I did. And she was writing in the past, in 2019, uh, with someone, um, some type of a um, something, and <laughs> I remember saying, I kept hearing page 43, page 43, so I asked Amanda what was on page 43, and part of it said, um, Peter is crying, and, you know, I'm really emotional. Jess is easily confused. We need to trust in who we are, not what we feel. For a few fleeting moments, we can feel our emotions, recognize them, process through them, but they don't define who we are. And I took that from her writing in 2019, and I pressed into that in other pages, but I literally wrote down at the bottom I feel like Amanda's writing will uh, reach people and give them a powerful message um, through it, thinking someday, you know, in a far-off land when she writes her books in another country. But I was one of the people that it touched. So God is so good using people like you guys always teach. There's no junior Holy Spirit. And there she is, like rocking my world, and you sharing about write stuff down. And it's from 2019. So it was so great. And, like, all the people that encouraged me, all the sister friends who spoke about the article, believed in me before I believed in myself. So I was able to encourage that same way at work this week because there's an internal position posted. And I think this specific lady would be great for that position. And I told her that she should apply. And she was like, oh, thank you so much. Not going to lie. That did cross my mind. But the little devil on my shoulder told me I'll never get that. And I'm not good enough for that position. I said, I'll punch the devil in the face for you. I said, that's a lie. He is a liar. I said, and we are going to declare that that door opens specifically for you if it's for you. And if it's not, it will gently close. And she was like, oh, I like that. So I was like, thank you, Lord. You know, because so many people believed in me, encouraged me. And I got to share like something similar with her. So God is good. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So on Sunday, I was watching a Christian who I follow on YouTube, um, and she was just talking about the real importance, importance right now of women who have had abortions to shout their testimony. And, you know, I've never had an abortion, but I just was really moved by it, and it was really convicting me to pray more for, for women and for the unborn. And so I decided to, um, on my day off, to go and drive and park and, and just sit at an abortion clinic and just pray over the place. And um, actually, while I was there, the Lord reminded me that abortion actually plays a huge um, part of my own testimony because my great-grandmother would have aborted my grandfather and as a result would have prevented 
including me, 33 people who are now on the earth. And so I was like, well, that is actually, that, no wonder I get to proclaim that because it's such a huge part of my testimony. And honestly, I, I think being, going and sitting in, a, um, in the parking lot of, of a, just a, a portal to death and a real um, place of destruction was like, wow, I was able to host the presence of God and actually allow the God to work through me because I'm a physical human being who is standing and representing him and he is able to move, move through me. And I just, I didn't realize that until I got home, but I had all these things that I wrote down that I'm believing him to be doing in that place. And it was just really, really cool to see him um, just move through me and actually get to bond with him and experience him like ministering in me and through me and uh, put some fire in my belly. So thank you, God. Yeah. Woo. Amen. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, Lord. So good. Come on up. Yay. Thanks, Lord. Hi. Yep. So go ahead and tell us your name and who you came with. My name is uh, Miles, Miles Burke. I am uh, here from the gracious invitation of Veronica. Um, I uh, grew up in this neighborhood right down Atlantic Avenue, right off the railroad tracks. So it's really something having walked past this building as a kid on the tracks to be inside. Well, um, he has a powerful testimony, and I want to encourage us afterwards because we don't have time to hear all of his testimony. He's going to give us the highlights, and then you guys can go up to him and ask him questions about his testimony, and he would love to share more with you afterward, too. Well, I am blessed, and I'm, it took me a long time to realize it, but I, I am a very blessed person. Despite, I married the uh, high school sweetheart. We were married for 30 years, two great kids. But my one son, 18 years old, about 20, about 38 years ago, uh, he died from uh, oxycotons, and people are still dying. It's, so I have this anger, and I held him in my arms while he died, waiting for the ambulance to come. And I didn't even know what an oxy was, and I grew up in the 70s, so I thought I knew everything. Uh, another 10 years later, my wife passed from complications, and uh, I was really mad. I got mad at the world. But the next day, I met my new wife the next day. And she had a similar story where her loved one passed it. He was 49. My wife was 49. And it's, after three years later of, you know, a love, we got married. And we're still married today. And that was some type of intervention where a door opens, a door shut, and there I was. So now I've got a bigger family. She brought her three kids. I have my uh, wonderful daughter, Amber, uh, who has grown up wonderfully despite having that much trauma. And um, then my health started taking turns. My knees went in 2018, my shoulders in or 2016, my shoulders and my neck. And then just last year, I spent close to 90 days in a hospital bed. Um, a lot of complications, but three times my wife was told bring in the next the kin and family. Hospice was called in. The chaplain was brought in. And uh, I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in remission now for um, eight months. And it's because so many people love me and were praying for me. Pastor Bill and the congregation out of Gainesville, Georgia, thank you. Thank you, everyone who has prayed for me because it made me believe I'm here for a reason. And I'm here because others helped me come out of that place. So I thank everyone and my family. I got the greatest family in the world. I've got the, everything. And you feel the love here. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, so, so good. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, we just bless the Lord. Wow, thanks, Jesus. So I got to hear a, a coworker of mine today give credit um, to the Lord, and she, I don't even think she really realized it at the time until I brought it up. So anyway, she's a coworker of mine that is down in Florida, and she called me up, <clears throat> and she said, you know, I know I told you before I have had this irritating, like, cough, and I can't seem to get rid of it, and I can't seem to get rid of it, and it's like I've had it for months. I was like, yeah, I remember you talking to me about that. She said, well, I, you know, went to the doctors because I'm like, hey, we got to figure out what this is. She was like, so I went um, yesterday um, to the doctor. The doctor walked in and said, oh, you know, yeah, you have a tumor on your kidney. She's like, what, 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 what are you talking about? What? what? So she was shocked. Um, but she was talking to me, and she said it was um, 
the tumor was about the size of her kidney. But she had no symptoms, nothing was going on. Um, and the doctor was like, well, if you didn't come in for this, we never would have found this. So obviously I'm praying for her to get surgery, but she's like, you know what, Indy? She said, but the weird thing is, ever since I went for that, I don't have the cough anymore. I said, well, that's not weird. Like, that was, like you know, that was Jesus that was giving you, like, she's like, you know what? I believe that. I believe that. So she's like, uh, I'm like, I'm still praying for you, obviously, that the tumor is going to shrink, that you don't even have to have the surgery. But, you know, just, she was like, yes, I know that was, that was Jesus that brought that up because he's like, it's, she's like, it's so weird that I just, I haven't had that cough. I said, it's not weird. It's not weird. Yeah. Amen. 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 Wow. Thanks, Lord. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. All right. Well, our pastor has a good word, so let's welcome him as he comes. All right. <clears throat> Shannon, you are just amazing. I mean, young woman, but boy, a powerful uh, person. If you just, you can sense in the spiritual realm, there's a lot of things going on. And so we are delighted to just be a part of the next generation that we can see and champion them. And that way, it's really good. Um, and Miles, you know, thanks for coming. Um, you know, God really loves you. And he, he cares for you. And um, it's not, not just a rhetorical, I must be here for a reason. Um, there is a very good reason for you to be here. And, uh, you know, e explore with the Lord on an intimate level. And ask him specifically. Because it's, when the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, there's a reason why he does that. Because you have a tremendous calling of your, on your life. And... Um, you know, pursue that, not just in a okay, but in a real in-depth way with the Lord. And he's a good God. He's a good God to you. He loves you like crazy and loves your family. And, uh, you know, so many of us think we, we're over the hump and we're going to, you know, move on. But um, I believe this generation that is in their, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, they're the ones who are called to amazing things that they thought they were not going to see, like Moses thought he was never going to see. And I really feel like uh, God has something for you, very special. Uh, and just hear him and give him the glory, because he's going to do amazing things. We're talking in the uh, Gospel of John, if you want to open your Bibles. Um, it's uh, chapter 18. Uh, one of the things we talked about is uh, just to give, again, because we, we stopped in the middle of that, is that um, Peter was in the garden and, you know, he, with a lot of the other uh, disciples, ran away. And then John, which was the disciple who loved Jesus, we, uh, he actually refers himself to as that, the one who leaned back and said, uh, it's going to be me. He's the one that in the end um, stays with Jesus all the time. And he's the one who actually walks in and was known in the guard and actually gets inside the, 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 into the inner court where the, uh, where the um, uh, Pharisees were. And, and Peter wants to get in, but he is not quite sure. He does, he's not known yet. John comes out and says, come on in and makes the way in. And we talked about last time a little bit that there's sometimes we want to get into places where we're not ready to carry the responsibility and the maturity come in. And when we're in there, we fail miserably. And uh, we talked about how um, Peter, in this particular instance, he comes in, wants to be there, wants to show that he's, he aligns with Jesus, wants to show Jesus that I'm really not going to betray you. I'm really going to be close to you. I told you I was going to be that, that, you know, I'm the one who cut the ear off. So, you know, cheer for me. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm following you, I'm going in there. And then he gets presented with just the, is the simplest things of, I, I've seen you. And he, at that point, uh, crumbles, and three times the conversation goes in that direction where he actually crumbles and says, uh, no, I don't know him, and he emphatically, and he starts bringing curses down on himself and saying, I don't know him. 
the problem sometimes with us is that we have this religious mindset that we think we all, we know the verses, we know everything, but then when, but when the practical application comes to say, okay, do, is what we know really what we have in our feet, in our, uh, in our hands, and in our lips, is, 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 it, is the action of love actually coming out or is it just the knowledge of it? And the challenge for us is to live a life that actually says, I don't want to just be a person that knows but I want to be a person not just that promises, but I want to become a person that actually lives it out. And you see in, in the Gospel of John, you see actually John actually lives that out. He is the one who stands at the bottom of the cross. So he's at the cross where Jesus is being crucified, and he actually stands there beside the mother of Jesus. And Jesus gives him the responsibility to take care of his own mom. So there, is, there are these people, there are these uh, persons who actually mature in a way and they can take responsibility that is put on their shoulders. And later on, you see, just a couple days later, Jesus enters, uh, um, you know, as uh, he comes back and he sees Peter and he is in this moment where he establishes Peter right then and there and says, on you I will build my church. So failures do not preclude you from being used in the kingdom. Your past does not say you cannot. And, you know, we're, we're, today we, we are people who we want to see, you know, if you failed, we want to see three years of really good behavior and all this kind of stuff. And it seems to be that a betrayal of that sort would not be something that you and I would probably forgive or the church forgives uh, or the family forgives in three days. And you have to ask yourself, what is it in Jesus that actually has, a, has the love and has the ability to forgive his, one of his closest friends, Peter, that he actually denied him in such a disdainful way, but yet Jesus never counted that against him. Jesus saw far more the heart than he saw the action. I feel that, uh, and we talked about this, uh, we make sin so much a moral issue as much as it is a brokenness. Sin is, uh, you know, we in the church, we bring sin as the highest uh, level of uh, morality and we reject people because of what they do and the sinful paths they've walked instead of us looking at the person is doing this because they no longer have a relationship with the Father and the relationship with the Father is what is broken and because of the brokenness, they no longer are able to make right choices. And we get offended because they don't make right choices, although that would be really dumb to do that because if people don't have a right relation with the Lord, they will not act accordingly. And our hearts should go out to these people instead of our hearts being hardened to those people and point the finger at them. Here we have a beautiful story of a relationship that actually lasted three and a half years where Jesus walked with these people every day together. They have a really close bond. They have a close relationship. He actually... The, is, is one that actually is called, Peter, James, and John's were his favorites that would go in to every single thing. And here, this particular one, the one who has the loudest mouth and always was taking charge and everything else, he is the one who in the end makes a, uh, um, a big mistake. And we have to start, you know, it's great to read the scripture and we go, oh yeah, that's great, and this Passover is coming soon, and, you know, we want to uh, excite ourselves uh, through that. But I feel we, we're remiss if we don't really look at that and find out where is it that we, not just the church, not just everybody, where is it that we have carried bitterness in our hearts because people have betrayed us so, um, so heavily? Where are the people that... Uh, that actually uh, come to our lives and say, I have done this and this and this, and where we carry a certain distance from them, where we don't want to trust them anymore, or we, we have this entitlement, I don't want to trust. There's an entitlement in the church today that says, I don't trust. There's an entitlement in families that says, I don't trust. There's an entitlement in, in the world that says, I don't trust. Because we have so many bad experiences and we entitle ourselves through the experience not to trust. What we reckon is that, well, because we look at mankind and we see the failures, we will not trust mankind. But that's really never what God has asked us to do. 
He's always asked us to trust him, not mankind. And the only person who grows when you trust is you. People will take advantage of you when you claim to trust them, but the person who's going to grow is you, is not them. If they betray you, if they falsify things, if they say things, they're not growing. They're actually going downhill. But you're the one who's growing when you start making a tribe of people your own. And the best example of Peter is that Peter actually made the disciples, the 12, and Jesus made him their own. This is his place. And yet he comes back and he's actually restored in a beautiful way. And that is the signature of the church. The church's signature is restoration. This church signature is not judgment, gossip, slander, and destroying people. That is the assignment of the devil when he, in, uh, he actually enters into people like he entered into Judas where he actually brought death to Jesus. And the church has to start learning that, but how is the church going to learn that if you and I don't learn that? You see, if we still carry bitterness from past years, when we still carry bitterness from what people have done, with your mom and dad have done everything else, all we're going to do is we're going to end up being people who don't, are not ready to walk into just per se, like Peter walked into the inner courts where they were talking and, and dealing with Jesus. He went in because he thought he could come in. Because he thought so highly of himself, but yet when he walked in, he couldn't carry down the pressure. And many of us, we want to be in the church. We want to be. But when it comes to the messy part of the church where people fail, where people do th stupid things, where people, then the response cannot be the pointy finger. The response has to be a, the response of Jesus. The response has to be the response of Jesus. And the response of Jesus is never one that judges, but he's always the one who thinks highly of you. The one that always thinks good thoughts about you. The one that never brings up the past, but only tells you what you were created and what you're made for because he cannot change. Because God, when he said, I forgive you and throw your sins as far as the east from the rest of me, he forgave all your sins, past, present, and future ones. And he can no longer choose to say, I want to now accuse you or want to judge you. He has not, he said, I will not do that. I'm only going to look at the good. So no matter if you find yourself in the deepest betrayal of your life, Jesus never says to you anything other but he's cheering you on. He doesn't allow you to think that he is no longer for you. And in that process, as we walk through this, I hope that we understand that the responsibility of ownership is on you and me in our personal life. Not just regular church standard, not denominations, not a building, not a people group. It is you and me who change the world. It is you and me that choose to say, I want to be a powerful person. I want to take responsibility and ownership. You know, um, we, we hear a lot of times people say, well, God allowed that. I'm not sure if that's a way how we try to blame God again. Because if we are truly aware of who we are, we would never say that. Because the misery that you and I are living in is because we, the church, we, the people, we, the believers, we, the children of God, didn't do our job representing Christ. It's so easy to say, well, God allowed that. No, God didn't allow that. You, we and I, you and I created this. And just to be a little bit more specific about that, we know that mankind is the only access for the spiritual realm. So I want to explain that again. Mankind is the only access to the spiritual realm. That's why Judas had to open up his heart for the devil to get in to do what he did. The demonic realm and the spiritual realm have no, uh, no way to enter this world because the world was given to mankind. Genesis talks about it. And so the only way they can enter, it, Christ can enter into you, and then we do what God calls us to, or the demonic realm can enter me by my choice to accepting that, and then this happens. And the world is full of areas and strongholds, the demonic strongholds that are there because mankind invited them. 
And so when now we are awakening, the church is awakening to this mode where they go, oh, we are actually this powerful. The Spirit of God is wooing His people back with the truth that we are that powerful, that we actually can do the things He called us to do, that we are actually that awesome that we can do. We've been given everything we need to live a life of God needs, that we can, the Bible says, to be holy for I'm holy. Be like me. Be like Christ. Our desire is not to be normal, but our desire to be like Christ. And there's something about that that when we grasp the concept, we can no longer with a good conscience say God allowed that. It's because we allowed it. We didn't follow our guidance to be really good at finances because, or really good at politics or really good in uh, the teaching or in inventions, art, entertainment, movies. We didn't do our part. We allowed a country to go to where we have come today, where abortions are good, where transgender is good, where everything else is allowed. We have allowed this, and God didn't allow it. We allowed it. We have allowed wrong to become right and right to become wrong. We have allowed it. And so we have to start taking ownership, and when you take ownership, you actually find out the responsibility God put on your shoulders. And only when you actually feel the weight of the goodness of God on your shoulders, not just God you do, but actually God says you do because I have empowered you. That's when our life will change. That's when the world will recognize the believer. If we walk to Jesus, we want to walk through this a little bit. It's impressive because... He says in verse 17, Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his uh, disciples and his teaching. In verse 20, I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I've always taught in the synagogue or at the temple where all the Jews came together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. The question is, the high priest questions Jesus about his teachings. It's weird because the high priest is in the temple, is in the synagogue as part of this whole process. And you have to find out that when people have a bend towards evil, when people have a bend that is not of the Lord, even when you're teaching, they will not hear what you're saying. And Jesus, all he's saying, he's he's putting that out there. He's not defending himself. He just said, I taught everything. Basically, you were there when I was teaching. Why are you asking me the question? He said, surely you've heard what I've said. All the people heard it. Nobody said anything. And then he says, when Jesus said this, one of these officials nearby struck him in the face. This is the way you answer the high priest, he demanded. And Jesus says something very interesting. Is He says, if I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke truth, then why did you strike me? This is not a response of a defense. This is a response of saying, this is what truth is. Tell me what I said where I'm lying. What actually happens, the demonic realm will always work with intimidation. The demonic realm will always attack with intimidation because it has no truth. So it always walks with intimidation. It always brings fear. It either bullies or goes with violence, but has some way to want to intimidate you from speaking truth. And it's important that we recognize that we are not the ones who are going to be intimidated. The Bible says we are not of those who shrink back, but we are of those who actually speak truth. Jesus was not intimidated by the guy hitting him because there was just truth to be said. That's all. Then Ananias sent him still bound to Caiaphas, the other high priest. And remember last time, this is the only time in history there were two high priests. And they actually were related, which was not a part of the Jewish law. But as Simon Peter was warming himself, he asked, Are you not one of the disciples? Are you? 
and this is where he says, I'm not, he denied it. One of the high priest's servants, relative of the man whose ear Peter cut off. I mean, this gets really weird. He's a relative. Everybody sees him. You know, and he goes, no, I didn't do it. And again, I just warn us, sometimes we can act so weird when we're not ready and matured to enter certain positions that God has for us. That's why important, it's important to not allow people to sometimes go into places where they're not mature enough to handle it. I've had a couple, this is years ago, I just had gotten here, and they said they, you know, they, they wanted to go to missionaries to Africa, and praise God, you want to go to Africa? And I asked them, so how did, how did that happen? Oh, God told us you go to Africa. I said, all right. Big part of life, I feel, is there's wisdom in counsel, right? And not in counsel that you think that people will agree with you. Counsel means of godly people. And so he gave up his 401ks, he gave up his pension, everything else. He went um, with a mission, and they trained him for a year. And I thought to myself, this is the stupidest thing you've done. And I met him again after a year, uh, and I was at a graduation, and there they were. And they came up to me and told me, oh, yeah, we're going. And I'm like... And I said to him, I said, I don't think that's the thing to do. And I gave him my reasons and stuff. And they were like, we're gone, Jesus said, Jesus said. They left. They went there. If I still get the story straight, they were there not even three weeks. Left everything, came back. You see, sometimes the, the euphoria of doing things for Jesus is so tantalizing. But the maturity of carrying it to the end is what the difference is. You want to be a part of a body? That means you've got to put out. What do I have to put out? Love. If you don't love people, you're not going to make it. If you are not ready to love people, you're not going to make it. If you're not ready to have Judas's and Peter's in your sphere of influence, you're not going to make it. Jesus says, the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the place for the Roman uh, governor, by now it was early in the morning to avoid the ceremony on cleansing. The Jews did not enter the palace, but they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. When John writes this, he really well has a point of trying to put the perspective in what's actually happening and the hypocrisy that they're living in. And I find it interesting that here they're actually, they have a prophetic word from Isaiah and all of the Old Testament of who the Messiah is going to be. They did not recognize the Messiah. But they still want to do Passover. So they don't want to go into the Roman place because they want to have Passover. But they, the, the promise of the Messiah, which who Jesus is, they want to kill him, but they still want to do the Passover. It's almost like we want to go to church. We don't really want to do all the community, all the, all the real part of church, but we just like the idea of going to church and having church for an hour or having church, whatever. But we, we really don't want to get too involved. But we like, the, we like the tradition. And let's be honest, if that's what drives us, let's ask God, God, give me a spirit of repentance that I may not want to do this just because this is what Christians do. Let me do this because I got to have a heart and a love for you. Let me do this because I can't wait to go to a growth group. I can't wait to see my brothers and sisters. I can't wait to hug them and love on them and, and declare and prophesy and cheer them on and be there with them. I can't wait to see their faces. I can't wait to see their smiles. I can't wait. 
if that's not what drives us to go, then we're just like people who just come. They want the traditional Passover, but they don't want to meet Jesus. If we just read this as a normal story, but we don't take inventory in our own lives, this, the church is never going to change. We, the believers, want to carry the manifest presence of the Lord. We don't want to just carry the Bible. We don't want to just carry the bread, but we want to carry the inspired word of the Lord. He says, so Pilate came out to them. What charges are you bringing against me or against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over. Now he becomes a criminal. Accusations of the enemy change so quickly because his point is to destroy. His point is not truth. His point is to destroy. When you find accusations, that's why it's not helpful to defend yourself. It's not helpful to get into arguments because arguments only stir up the enemy's intent to make you stumble and make you angry, make you frustrated. He's waiting for an opportune time to get you to a place where he can get you. So you don't get into arguments. You said there's a reason why God says so many things in Scripture not to do these things because he doesn't want the enemy to get a foothold. But when you think like Peter that I can handle it, I can go, I can play at the fence, I can hang out with angry people, I can hang out with gossip and slanders, I can hang out with people who are not really fully lovers of God, I can make those, then you're going to find you're going to get burned. They wanted to have their Passover. But the one that actually prophetically was the blood on the door frames, they didn't want him. The one who was the lamb, they didn't want him, but they wanted to have the religious exercise. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happens that the words Jesus had spoken indicated the kind of death he was going to die. In John 12, it says that Jesus says, my body will be lifted up. The Jewish, in the Jewish tradition, execution was done by stoning alone. It was a quick and swift death. We always think it takes forever. It didn't take long. Stoning took, I can't tell you, minutes or seconds, but stoning was a quick and swift death. The Romans invented the crucifixion as a most brutal way to die. People would sometimes hang there three to four days. So imagine you're hanging there three, four days, you're hanging with, on, your, on your hands and your feet were clubbed, and then when it took too long, they would actually break your bones so you no longer can push yourself up and breathe so you would asphyxiate. They went away from the Jewish law because they should have stoned him, but they didn't. They wanted him to die the most ugly death possible. Imagine the hatred. And the, I, I just want to say this. Judas never intended, I believe, to have Jesus crucified. He just, whatever he did, but he never knew how far it was going to get. When we allow the enemy to come in and we give him an open door, we never know how far it will go. That's why it's important to live in community. That's why it's important to have friends that know you well. Not just know you, but know you well. That when you become weird or you do weird stuff, that they actually tell you, this is weird, this is not godly. This thought process. The more open and transparent you are, the cleaner you get. The more you hold everything in, the more you don't talk, the more you say, I don't want to say, I'm going to be weird. The, worry, the weirder you will become. We don't want to know your stuff. But you want us to know your stuff. I don't want to know your stuff. But you want me. Why? Because you want to get free. 
You want to share the weaknesses. You want to share. And I'm saying, don't stand up here and do that. That's not what we're talking about. But you want to live in community. You want to live in a place where you're safe, but where people tell you the love of God. And the love of God will not always feel good to you because the love of God will be in contrary to your flesh, in contrary to your dreams maybe, in contrary to everything that you always wanted. But God says you have to lose your life in order for you to gain life. That's not a message that wins a popularity contest. Not, nobody runs to church because, ah, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. But only those who actually know who they are created to be run there. Because I know the life that God has for me is so much more. It says, for the joy set before me. You see, in the Garden of Eden, there was Adam who sinned. And Jesus, the Father, said to him, I will get you back. He didn't throw him out of the garden. We always read that, but in the Hebrew, it doesn't say that. In the Hebrew, it's, it's meant that I will get you back. That's why the clothing and the sword is the word of God. And he says, I will get you back. And here he is. He's giving himself up for the joy set before him. The joy means, I'm so excited to get you back. I know my reason to coming was to die. That's why he said, my reason comes to be, there's no greater man than one who serves one another. Jesus served. He served unto death. For a good man, somebody may die, but for a bad man, nobody does that. And Jesus did exactly that. He laid his life down. There's no entitlement on that. All it is is I'm living out my purpose, my destiny that God has for me. And that is uncomparable to anybody. I don't, have to, I don't have to share my destiny with somebody else. I have my own destiny. And it's amazing. If you're the president, if you are a policeman, if you're a teacher, if you're a Wawa person, if you whatever you are, you're the most amazing person you are. Nobody compares to you. You never live in comparison. You only live in the identity of God and that God said for you forward and you find complete satisfaction making $20 an hour or $100,000 an hour because it's not the world you live for. It is for the kingdom. It is for eternity. It is for Jesus. And Jesus, for the joy set before him, said, I'm going to die this death because this death will bring life to all of them. I'm going to gain them back. Imagine that joy. And can we identify with a joy like that, that maybe we're going to be mistreated, maybe we're going to be laughed upon, which is most people don't like that, or we'll be shunned, nobody invites us to a party, and we feel like we're persecuted. Or people kind of talk weird and snicker about us, gossip to us because we're followers of Jesus. And we're like, I don't know. They have some rude comments of us on Facebook or whatever. No. That's nothing. That doesn't, that's, it, it, there's other people who die because they profess Jesus as their King and Lord. They're challenged. We're going to kill your kids if you don't re renounce Jesus and the kids are being, being killed and tortured. And you go, well, isn't that rude? Isn't that awful? Yeah, but I don't live for this world. See, Jesus did that. Peter wasn't quite ready for that. Although he said, I'm ready to die for you. And the church maybe says that, but we're not quite there yet, maybe. But we have to get to a point where you go, okay, God, I'm giving it all, all for you. That means my prestige, my position, everything that I am, my rights, my entitlements. Yes, and my past too, and my bitterness and my failures. I give it all to you for the one reason only, because I want to follow you, and I can't follow you with all my baggage. I can't follow you with all my crap. I can't follow you with I have to give it all to you. And I give it all to you because you gave everything and it was joy for you to give it. So I give it with joy too. And maybe you'd be honest and go, I'm not so joyful right now. 
I mean, there's some stuff that I just find a lot of pleasure in. I, at least I find security in. I don't trust God that much. God's not offended. But don't hide it. Just tell him. Lord, I give you all this. This will stay with me for a little bit. But I, I'm showing it to you. But one thing I do say, God, I want you to show me how this is not as important as you. Show me that this has nothing on you. Show me that this is not my God. Show me that you are my God. And in that, we find freedom. In that, we find truth. In that, we find the life that God wants us to give. Amen? Bless you.